recording right now. Um, so this webinar is being recorded and shortly after we will we will make uh, the recording to the webinar as well as the slides available to everyone who registered. We'll be sending that out over email. Um, so I think that's enough for, for housekeeping items. Let's get into the content now. Um, I'll pass things off to Elnaz, who's going to be our first speaker. Thank you, Sarah, and hello, everyone. My name is Elnaz Adabash, and I recently joined CPATH as the Executive Director for the Type 1 Diabetes Consortium, and I'm very excited to welcome you to today's webinar. To begin, we want to recognize the significant contributions and efforts of the numerous individuals uh, that contributed to this tool, including the Type 1 Diabetes Consortium funding members, the coordinating committee, our academic advisors, the various institutions and organizations who provided the data that informed the design of the tool we'll be speaking about today, as well as the numerous individuals across CPATH, including members of our data sciences and quantitative medicines teams who, who worked so tirelessly on this tool. Thank you to all of you for the work that you have done to bring this tool, which we hope will strengthen clinical trial design in T1D2 fruition. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank the thousands of patients who participate in these clinical trials. It's through their willingness to commit so much of themselves, their time and their energy that enables these trials and provides us with the patient level data that helps advance the scientific innovation that we hope to achieve. Next slide, please. So as a quick overview, uh, today's webinar will begin with a brief introduction to type 1 diabetes and then discuss the development of, clinical, of the clinical trial enrichment tool, including the data and the modeling that informed the tool design, the use of the synthetic data in the tool, and the history of the T1D consortium uh, islet, on, islet autoantibody qualification. We'll follow that by a demonstration of the tool and some use cases, and then as Sarah mentioned, we will conclude with a Q&A period for those who are attending this webinar live. Next slide, please. So to begin, as a brief overview of the disease progression models of type 1 diabetes, this is an autoimmune disorder for which there is a strong genetic predisposition. So individuals with relatives who have the disease exhibit a 15 times greater lifetime risk of developing type 1 diabetes. The preclinical phase of the disease is characterized by the development of islet autoantibodies, initially without any impact on blood glucose levels. However, as disease progression continues, patients present with deregulated blood glucose levels and hypoglycemia, followed by the clinical diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. When we look at the progression rates across the various stages of type 1 diabetes, what we see is that at stage 1, while there is a 100% lifetime risk of developing type 1 diabetes, the five-year risk is only 50%. Whereas at stage two, the lifetime risk remains 100%, but the five-year risk jumps up to 75%. Therefore, developing therapeutic strategies that can delay or prevent type 1 diabetes onset are critical. And despite the discovery of insulin to manage the disease and the development of glucose monitors to help the daily lives of patients, T1D remains a disease that has a significant burden on patients' lives and has also a considerable unmet patient need. Next slide, please. The most striking demonstration of this unmet need is that, is that a type 1 diabetes diagnosis is associated with poor long-term patient outcome and decreased lifetime expectancy, including a loss of 10 to 16 years of life years, depending upon the age of diagnosis. So this occurs in part because about 80% of patients are unable to meet their glucose control targets. And as a result of numerous long-term complications, uh, I'm sorry, and as a result, develop numerous long-term complications associated with type 1 diabetes, including retinopathy, neuropathy, as well as renal and cardiovascular disease. Importantly to date, there have been no approved disease-modifying therapies for T1D, and the only therapies that are available to patients are those that manage the clinical and metabolic manifestations of the disease, which alone are not sufficient. Therefore, to make the most significant impact on improving patient lives, we need to both delay the age of disease onset and diagnosis, and also develop therapies that can slow disease progression and increase life expectancy for those who are ultimately diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Next slide, please. 
So when we think about this unmet need, it's really borne out in the stories of patients that are living with type 1 diabetes. And on this slide, we're highlighting a couple of those uh, patient testimonials where patients often speak about the significant daily burden of living with the disease and the impact that delaying diagnosis or progression can have on improving their quality of life. These patients also often speak to the generational impact of the disease and what it would mean for their children to not have to deal with the same burden that they have had to deal with for quite as long as they have had to deal with. And so this is obviously a very important consideration is making sure to address this unmet need. Next slide, please. So in taking into account the significant challenges and patient needs associated with type 1 diabetes, in 2017, CPATH formed the Type 1 Diabetes Consortium to advance therapeutic development, particularly focusing on disease prevention. Since that time, we've also expanded our efforts to include therapies that delay disease progression as well. The Type 1 Diabetes Consortium acts as a collaborative public-private partnership that brings together the Type 1 Diabetes community across industry, academia, clinicians, regulatory agencies, and patient advocates in order to achieve our goals. This slide really highlights some of the participating members of the Type 1 Diabetes Consortium who have provided everything from data support, scientific advisory guidance, supporting of drafting of regulatory filings and so on. So there is a huge breadth of expertise to this consortium and one that really uh, we leverage to achieve our goals. Next slide, please. So to accomplish the goal of accelerating this therapeutic development, we focused on strategies to improve clinical trial design. Now, islet autoantibodies, which you'll hear us uh, speak about often, are already being used as biomarkers for clinical trial enrichment. However, they alone have not proven to be sufficient because the rates of disease progression, which I mentioned a few moments ago, are so high. Therefore, our approach was to take uh, it was, our approach was to obtain clinical trial data sets from numerous studies, aggregate patient level data from these trials, and utilize this data to build disease models that would improve the utility of these islet autoantibodies as enrichment biomarkers. Our ultimate goal here is to submit these models for regulatory review and approval so that they can then be applied to future drug development programs as well as future clinical trials. So to speak more about these biomarkers and into the tool design, I'm going to hand it over to Stephen Carpin, who is our next speaker. Thanks, Lamaz. Hi, everyone. Uh, Stephen Carpin here. I'm the Senior Scientific Director for our Type 1 Diabetes Consortium. Um, so like Alma said, our, our approach here as a consortium was to really think about how we can improve the way that we enrich our trials in this T1D delay or prevention space. And you have to pause and ask the question, why? Why enrich our trials at all? A um, couple places we can look to answer that question include the relevant FDA guidance document that exists. So FDA has a guidance document titled Enrichment Strategies for Clinical Trials to Support Determination of Effectiveness of Human Drugs and Biological Products. And in that guidance, they define enrichment as the prospective use of any patient characteristic to select a study population in which detection of a drug effect, if one is in fact present, present is more likely than it would be in an unenriched population. Um, what that basically tells us is that when you are enriching uh, your clinical trials for patients that do have this particular characteristic, um, you're going to be able to increase the statistical power of your trial. Maybe that means you have a, a comparable study design, but with less patients. Maybe that means you've got um, the same study design, but with more confidence in what those results will look like. But ultimately, the, the goal of enriching our trials is to make sure that our trials are as likely as possible to be able to see drug effects um, with as much power as possible. So like Alna said, when we think about that in the context of type 1 diabetes, we're trying to really improve on what we already know about risk of progression. So we're taking a, a population of patients that are at risk, but maybe with unknown individual risks of progression. We're trying to characterize and understand their individual risks of progression. And then we want to include just those patients that are most at risk so that we are most likely to see a drug effect in those patients. Uh, on the next slide, please, you can see that there's many different ways to think about implementing um, biomarker enrichment strategies into your clinical trial. Um, these are just three of them. This is certainly not a comprehensive list, but this is three different tools that the consortium has um, been developing or will be developing to implement these biomarkers as uh, enrichment tools into clinical trials. So this starts, like Elma says, um, with the biomarker enrichment models, really thinking about biomarker enrichment at the individual patient level. 
And these models that I'm referring to here are those that featured in the EMA qualification, which I'll talk a little bit more about. The second tool, which we will talk a lot more about today, is the clinical trial enrichment tool itself. Really thinking about using these biomarkers at a population level, not just to understand an individual's risk of progression, but to understand who, what, what types of patients should be enrolled in your trial. What is the population that you need to target in order to have this optimized trial design? What I won't talk about today is the clinical trial simulation tool. This is what the uh, type 1 diabetes consortium will be focusing on over the next couple of years. Um, this includes um, trial enrichment, ways to optimize your trial based on identifying the right patients to include, but this will also help inform your decisions about how long your trial should be, um, what your endpoint should be. This helps to account for things like potential drug effects or dropout effects in your trial, and it allows you to simulate um, virtual trials before you actually initiate a live trial. And the thing to note about these different tools uh, from left to right, these are um, increasing in complexity. And what that means is that we've got to make sure we have sufficient data to support that increased complexity. As the tools become more complex, as they have more data needs, there's also more that you can do with these types of tools. So if you're interested in learning more about what we will be doing with the CTS tool, the clinical trial simulation tool, um, do feel free to contact us either through CPATH website or through the email that will be available to you at the end of the presentation today. But for now, we'll focus in a little bit on these first two tools, the biomarker enrichment models and the clinical trial enrichment tool. On the next slide, like I mentioned, to build these tools, they're, they're really fundamentally dependent on the data that's available to um, support the modeling and the analysis that needs to happen. We can do this with individual data sets, but we greatly improve our ability to really understand what's going on, to see um, much more than we would um, with one trial if we are able to aggregate data from multiple data sets. And that's really the core of this work, aggregating multiple data sets, curating and standardizing that data, developing one large integrated and aggregated database, and then using that as the basis for our analyses. So to date, the Type 1 Diabetes Consortium has acquired 10 different data sets. However, in this um, initial EMA qualification opinion, the biomarker enrichment models, um, just three of those studies were included, TEDI, TN01, and DAISY. The reason for this is um, kind of multifactorial. Um, first and foremost, some of these data sets were just not available to the consortium at the time of those analyses, hence they weren't included. Um, other reasons why some data sets may not have been included is as we go through that curation and standardization process, um, there's always a little bit of data attrition, and in some cases, data sets don't have the necessary variables that we need to include them in the aggregated um, database. So in this case, for our EMA um, qualification opinion for the islet autoantibodies as enrichment biomarkers, um, TEDI and TN01 were used as our analysis set for model building, and DAISY was used as our um, validation data set to actually confirm that the models were doing what we think that they were doing. On the next slide, we can take a little bit of a dive into these studies, and then I'm going to hand it over to JD to talk about what that modeling actually looked like and how we actually put this data to work. So why are these three studies appropriate for thinking about um, allied autoantibodies as enrichment biomarkers? And the key thing is these are three different longitudinal observational studies looking at patients that are high risk or individuals that are at high risk and following them from um, different potential time points for enrollment into the study, but following them all the way through the development of islet autoantibodies and then through the development of type 1 diabetes. So you can see from the numbers here on the slide, these are quite large screening studies. This is a vast amount of data um, whittling down pretty quickly from patients in the hundreds of thousands that were actually screened to um, just in the thousands or in aggregate the tens of thousands that were followed after the development of islet autoantibodies. Um, the way that we then took this data from these thousands of patients and put it to work is something that I'm going to hand it over to JD now to, to talk a little bit more about. Thanks, Steven. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jagdeep Purishetti. I am the Director of Predictive Analytics with the Quantitative Medicine Program at the Critical Path Institute. So in the next few slides, as Steven mentioned, I will go over the data curation and the modeling analysis that we performed to support the end qualification and then eventually build the CT tool. Um, so as uh, Stephen was mentioning, the, the data sets that we used for this particular EMA qualification effort were TN01, TEDI, and TrialNet. Uh, the information that we had um, in those data sets that we extracted for the modeling analysis included uh, demographic data, blood test, and risk factor. And the way we performed the um, data curation, as you can see um, in this funnel diagram on the, 
on your uh, screens uh, was essentially to get to the derived baseline, which was in line with the context of use. So essentially we were trying to look for uh, or build an analysis that would have a derived baseline that would have first record of a subject with two or more autoantibodies and also complete information of OGTT and HbA1c. Go to the next slide. So with the analysis that derived, we performed um, modeling analysis and the modeling analysis that we performed here uh, was time to t and diagnosis. There are multiple models that can be explored. Um, the most common one, uh, as a lot of you might be familiar with, is the Cox proportion hazard. Um, on the right-hand side, you will see the work, uh, workflow for the modeling analysis. We started with the analysis subset um, and performed the univariate Cox proportion hazard uh, modeling analysis, um, and then covariate selection, and then a multivariate Cox proportion hazard. The uh, the one caveat with the Cox proportion hazard model is to test the test for the proportion hazard assumption, which unfortunately in our case was violated. So we explored alternative modeling framework. The the one that we uh, explored next after the Cox proportion hazard was the accelerated failure time model, and here we performed the univariate and covariate selection um, process, and you will see the list of covariates uh, that we had uh, identified. Through the uh, through the covariate selection analysis um, listed here, and I highlight those because those are the ones that we used to build the FT model and find the um, find the beta coefficient, um, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, in any case, uh, once the FT model was uh, built, we performed model diagnostics and external validation using Daisy Daisy data set that was set aside. Um, so, um, also one other note, um, if you want to learn more about the modeling analysis, um, um, there is a link to the publication that just came out, which focuses on the modeling analysis in depth. So, just want to highlight that. Let's go to the next slide. So, here's what the uh, AFT model looks like. I want to highlight um, the beta and the X. So, those are the um, the, the variables that we are most interested in. The X represents the different covariates that were listed on the previous slide. And through the modeling analysis work, we are trying to find the beta coefficient for each of those covariates. The SI of T is uh, the survival uh, function. So essentially how long, uh, trying to figure out how long it would take for an individual uh, with an underlying baseline information to uh, get a T and D diagnosis. The other aspect is that the AFT model is parametric, so we need to determine uh, which is the most appropriate uh, distribution to parameterize the AFT model. In this case, we uh, explored multiple different uh, distributions um, through AIC and AIC, which is aka information criteria and graphical inspection. Um, and we found that viable distributions, viable distribution was the most appropriate in this case. Go to the next slide. So here you will see the uh, parameter estimates after the model training process. So again, the data sets that we used included uh, TrialNet and uh, Teddy. And you will see the second column here is where you get the beta coefficient. Um, for the axis, which is the first column, the COVID it. Uh, I also want to highlight the last column, which shows the interpretation of beta coefficients. So what are these? What are these negative values or positive values? What do they mean, right? So, for example, if you look at the 120 minute OGTT, um, the unit increase in the log blue 120 standardized. Um, this value reduces time to treatment diagnosis by 40 percent. Or another example is the sex. So, if you are male. Uh, the chances increases by 30% for you to get a TMD diagnosis. So um, that's sort of the interpretation of the beta coefficients. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So in addition to uh, estimating the parameters, we also performed model validation and diagnostics. And one of the commonly used way to perform uh, model diagnostics 
um, and validation is through uh, these PC style plots. And here on the left panel, you will see uh, five-fold cross validation. Um, here you'll see the black curve represents the Kaplan-Meier estimate with the black shaded region as the 95% uh, prediction interval. And the red line is the um, model prediction and red shaded region is the 95% prediction interval. And on the right panel, you'll see the external validation results with the Z data set. So uh, you will see that there is a good graphical fit. Um, ultimately, the models provided uh, sufficient evidence to support the EMA qualification. Um, to talk more about the opinion, EMA qualification opinion, I would hand it back to Stephen. Thanks, JD, and hello again, everybody. Um, yeah, so, so what did we do with all these models now, and, and what does it mean? So the, these models were really the core of our submission to the um, the EMA qualification of novel methodologies pathway, which is a way to seek their formal regulatory endorsement for this work. And it's important to note here, we'll look at the specific context of use for how these models are uh, endorsed to be used um, on the next slide. But the models themselves are not what was being endorsed by the agency. The models were what we used to provide sufficient evidence that the islet autoantibodies and those additional clinical patient features that were identified are appropriate ways to enrich your clinical trials in the context of T1D uh, delay or prevention studies. So the, the ultimate qualification opinion statement, EMA's kind of one sentence conclusion regarding the modeling work and what it tells us is that positivity to at least two of the following autoantibodies listed on the screen are qualified for use as enrichment biomarkers, importantly, in combination with the clinical parameters, sex, baseline age, blood glucose measurements from the 120 minute time point of the OGTT test and HbA1c. Um, that is for use in patients that are at risk for um, developing type 1 diabetes in those clinical, uh, the, the relevant um, T1D prevention clinical studies. So on the next slide, we'll see the full context of use. So a context of use, for those that aren't too familiar with it, is essentially analogous to a drug label for a, a drug product. This tells you how the tool is endorsed to be used. It tells you who it can be used in and how this tool can really be put to use according to EMA's qualification opinion. So you can see the top line sentence there at the top. And I'll just point out a couple of things here. I won't spend time reading through each of this. But on the second bullet general area, you can see that this is um, really targeting enrichment biomarkers for delay or prevention clinical studies. And then on the fifth bullet, you can see, excuse me, the fourth bullet, you can see the stage of drug development for use. So this includes all clinical efficacy evaluation stages um, where you're looking at preventing or delaying type 1 diabetes. And that includes early signs of efficacy, pivotal um, registration studies, proof of concept studies, dose raging studies, basically any study where you're looking at evaluating clinical efficacy of the drug, EMA has found that this would be an appropriate way to enrich those studies. There's a couple of things there listed that are out of scope for this um for for this context of use specifically um the um evidence that was provided through these models um does not account for the longitudinal serial conversion of the different islet autoantibodies so the way that we use that to write baseline that jd talked about we are looking at a single time point screening and then looking forward from that assessment not including assessment for the time course of serial conversion and then the other um, at a scope for these models as these models are not intended to be used to generate um, virtual subpopulations for simulation. That'll be a little bit different from what Nick will talk about with us in a moment about the synthetic data that's a part of this clinical trial enrichment tool, um, but the models themselves are not intended to be used to generate virtual subpopulations. All right, so then with that EMA qualification opinion behind it, and knowing that the models themselves are not what are endorsed, but the use of the islet autoantibodies with those identified clinical features, we're going to jump over now to our clinical trial enrichment tool, where we'll spend most of the rest of the webinar talking about. The CTE tool itself is one way to use the models that were featured in that qualification opinion that's consistent with the context of use. This makes it a nice, easy, um, interface for non-modelers and modelers alike to really interact with this tool to understand um, how those models can be used to inform your decisions about what patients you should enroll in your trial. We're going to start with a um, 
a pre-recorded live demonstration of the tool in action. And then we'll break down a couple of components of the tool, look at a couple of case examples, and then we'll have some, some time for, for a Q&A and some discussion. So let me pause here. I will kick it back to Sarah to or Brianna to queue up our demonstration of the tool. Thank you so much, Stephen. I will get this playing momentarily. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Pauly and I'm a developer on the quantitative medicine team at Critical Path Institute. Today I will be doing a demonstration of the type 1 diabetes clinical trial enrichment tool that I have been building. Here you see the landing page for the tool. Uh, first time users are able to take a tour of the tool. So this is going to walk you through where you would put in your inputs. Uh, how you would customize the eyelid autoantibody combinations, how the tool is run, where you can download the tables and plots that are produced. Uh, this is how you would be able to navigate the results and if you would like to learn more on the about page. All right, so let me just uh, start by explaining a little bit more about what this tool does. This side panel over here is where you're going to design a patient population. Um, so by selecting these different user inputs and these ranges, it's going to take those and filter down a synthetic data set that's in the background of synthetic patients. And it's going to filter those down to the user inputs, and then it's going to apply that data set to an accelerated failure time survival model and plot those results and produce some summary statistics on those. So let's go ahead and demonstrate some of this. Um, these are the default settings, and these actually select almost all the, the patients that are in the synthetic data set. So we have 500 patients. Um, that's going to be the total population for the trial. Um, this is going to be the percentage male patients. That's defaulted to 50%. The baseline age range is from 0 to 15, and baseline HbA1c is from 4% to 6%. And finally, the 120-minute glucose is going to be 80 to 150. Um, below here, you have the option as the user to select specific percentages of patients that you would like to see represented in the clinical trial. So these uh, five combinations of islet autoantibodies were the ones used in the model. Um, so you can, if, for example, you were interested in IA2A ZNT8, you can click this box here. You can enter a specific percentage. And for example, in this example, you would be taking 50% of all the patients out of 500 would have this islet autoantibody combination, and the remaining 50% would have um, any any combination. So you can customize more than one if you want to uh, do these two, for example, and have them each be 25%, you would be able to enter that as such, and then the remaining 50% will sample from any combination. Um, to get things started, I'm going to not use these customization features and just look at these filters above. So again, we have these default settings, and I'm going to go ahead and run the tool with just these settings above. Okay, so as you can see here, we have a plot that is showing the probability of a type 1 di diabetes diagnosis for this patient population. Um, so that's represented on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we have the time in years, 0 to 6 years. So with these inputs, we have a relatively shallow survival curve, um, and that is because there's many different patients represented in here. Um, these are the confidence bands, the, the red lines, and the, the middle line is the, the mean um, for that population. So um, what we can do is increase some of this. So let's say you wanted to select the IA2A ZNT8 uh, combination, and let's say you wanted 50% of all patients 
to have that combination. So we'll go ahead and run that tool. You can see that this starts to increase a little bit. Um, so that's gone up by including 50% of the patients with that combination. And we can further adjust these numbers to see how it reacts. So for example, if we, if we do things like adjust the HbA1c to say that we only want patients with a baseline HbA1c of 5% to 6.4%, we can adjust that slider there. And um, let's go ahead and run this, see what happens here. That goes up a little further. And then if we also bump up this 120 minute glucose, so if I set that to 125 to 195, only selecting patients in that range, we can run this again. You can see that goes up quite a bit more. So at, at three years, we have um, something like 0 0.6, 0 0.6 is the mean. Uh, for the survival curve there, and at seven years, we're up to uh, 0 0.85. Um, so that is that is the plot function. Um, over on the summary tables is going to be a recap of the CTE summary, so what the mean and the confidence intervals were at these different year points, as well as a synopsis of these inputs um, to, to be used in the download report function later, and I'll show that in a bit. And let me show a little more about this customization of the eyelid autoantibody combinations. Um, there's actually this tab right here. You can see it says eyelid autoantibodies. If I click over there, this is actually going to show what the, um, the underlying combinations are for that patient population. So if you recall for that last demonstration, um, we wanted 50% of the patients to have that IA2A ZNT8 combination. So now we can see we have IA2A ZNT8. Uh, there's 50% of patients, you can see that over here as well, have that combination. Um, and then the remaining patients just have any of the 11 combinations. So you can hover over these if you're interested in a specific one um, and see how many patients, how many percentage is of patients have that specific combination. And this is just an additional set of plots here. So this is gonna look at, um, again, IA2A ZNT8 has the most here because 50% of the patients have that combination. This is looking at the number of patients over 120 minute OGTT values so for comparison there. Um, so let me just show a little more of what this looks like. Uh, again, so like, let's say you wanted to just look at patients that have, or you wanted to have the majority of patients have the GAD65 IAA combination, or, or just GAD65, any, any set of combinations with that. So we can select these three, and let's say you want 75% of the total combinations, total population to have one of these three combinations. I'm going to select that there. I'm going to run this again. And we can see once again, you have 25% have, have this combination here, um, another 25%, another 25%, and the remaining are going to have the remaining combinations. Um, take these away and just run the full distribution there. We can see that the patients have been sampled across the board with any of these combinations, and those are represented there. Um, so you can you can do this in any number of ways. If you wanted 100% of patients to have this combination, you can run it. You can see that all the patients sampled will just have the IA2A ZNTA combination, and switching over to that plot uh, shows those values there. Um, again, running it removes those filters, so any combination is represented. You can go back and look at the results here. Um, so that is that is the survival plot. If you wanted to save some of these results, you can click this button here, which downloads a report. It's gonna spit out a PDF. And if we open that up, you can see that the, the plots and the tables that were produced in the tool are represented in this PDF document that you can save for your own use. Um, and finally, I do have a about page in here. So what this is, is a, a further description of the underlying model that uh, the tool uses, the accelerated failure time survival model. And it also includes a synopsis of the synthetic data and how it was generated um, and used in this tool. 
And finally, there's also a, a further user guide to explain how this all works. So if you click that button, open this up, this will have a user guide that, that further explains how one would go about operating the tool. Uh, so that is the conclusion of my presentation. Great, and I'll hand things back over to Brianna with the slides. I'll jump back in here. So, so as you can see in this tool from what from what Mike has showed us, and we'll look at a couple other case examples in a bit. Um, it, it's it's great. You have a, a nice interface to make this tool to make this tool dance. You can really understand how a particular patient's risk of progression or a particular population of patients' risk of progression is going to change depending on how that population changes. And, and there aren't really any new groundbreaking findings from this modeling that are incorporated into this tool, right? If patients A1C at baseline is higher, if your OGTT at baseline is higher, they're going to have a higher risk of progression makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that I had mentioned before um, about this tool was the use of synthetic data to underpin the, um, the actual modeling that's presented on the tool itself. Um, I'm going to tap on Nick's shoulder to step in and speak a little bit about the work we've done with synthetic data. Hi, everyone. So I'm uh, Nick Henscheid. I'm a quant med scientist uh, at CPATH. And uh, I worked on generating a synthetic patient population to use in the CTE. And I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the techniques, at least at a high level, that went into that, uh, and a little bit about why we would use synthetic data, and then show some of the results that hopefully will convince you that the synthetic data um, is reliable and legitimate, and you can trust the results uh, that are generated using it. Um, so, just at a really high level, the goal of synthetic data is to give you sort of another option uh, in between keeping your data completely to yourself and opening up access to your data to sort of a, a general scientific public. And um, most of these sort of modern synthetic data generation uh, methodologies are based on machine learning at some level. So we'll talk on the next slide about uh, what that looks like in a little bit more detail. But just to give you kind of the high level overview, um, the goal of synthetic data generation is to, to mask the true underlying data um, in your, your training population and also the, the details about the data contributors um, and generate new patients that statistically act like the population, um, but are not are not actual uh, real patients. So you're, you're preserving patient security while maintaining statistical utility of the population that you're using. Um, and so the obviously you're um, having increased utility of, of your data to the community um, while maintaining privacy and vice versa. You're, you're increasing privacy while maintaining utility. Uh, next slide. So the goal is to produce a synthetic data set that um, you know, secures the original data, which is going to happen just by nature of uh, the methodology that um, produces the synthetic data. And then you also want to preserve statistical utility. Um, machine learning, and uh, specifically deep learning, turns out to have a, a really rich set of tools to do exactly this. You can phrase both of those uh, pieces as mathematical questions, as mathematical optimization problems, and then design a deep learning algorithm that produces synthetic patients that have that statistical utility. And it's the training algorithm, it's the training process that, that forces your generative model, your machine learning model, to produce patients that are statistically similar to the, the underlying population. So we used an open source um, Python package that's called the Synthetic Data Vault. Uh, so we didn't write this package, but it is a, a very widely used in the um, synthetic data world. Uh, specifically, it's a, it's a package that is very good at generating synthetic tabular data that has mixed data types, which is exactly what our um, C1D data set has. It has a mix of binary data types, categorical data types, and um, uh, real continuous valued uh, data types. Um, and the underlying machine learning algorithm, just to, to give a little bit more information, um, is what's called a generative adversarial network. It's a, it's a variant, uh, a generative adversarial network is a very general category of machine learning algorithm. Um, and the synthetic data vault uses a specific variant of that. 
to produce their tabular data. Um, another piece that the SDV package has that's extremely convenient is it allows you to impose constraints. We know that the data that we're working with has uh, specific constraints about the variables uh, involved, uh, such as the, the actual islet autoantibody combinations only occur in certain combinations based on the restrictions that we made when we created the analysis subset. And so we can impose those constraints so that we generate a, a, a data set that is as realistic as possible to the true underlying data. Um, and so just to explain a little bit about what happens, the real patient uh, records go into the training algorithm uh, along with some tuning parameters for the algorithm. Um, the training algorithm is basically an optimization method that selects the best case, the best parameters to fit the model to the data set. And then what comes out of the other end is what's called a generative model. And a generative model takes basically random number generator uh, and runs it through the neural network, runs it through the synthetic data generator to produce these synthetic patients. And the synthetic uh, patients look exactly like the true uh, underlying training data uh, in, in form. Uh, the, the form of the data is exactly the same and the statistics will match, which we'll see on the next page. Um, but again, none of the patients that are shown in this synthetic data set, none of these are uh, real patients. So you would never be able to take data like this, trace it back in any way to determine any particular patient uh, was in the training data set. So it secures the, the true patient data in that sense. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so a, 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 a key piece of synthetic data generation that you're probably very interested in is how do you assess the utility and, and privacy of the data? Obviously we're generating uh, a population that is um, not the true data that was used to fit the model. So you have must have the reasonable question of how, how do you know if the, the synthetic population is any good uh, for our analysis? And there's a whole variety of ways of testing the quality of a synthetic data set. Um, just again, to give a high level overview, I can give more mathematical details if anyone has specific questions. Um, but basically you, you test the, the quality of the synthetic data, the statistical utility by matching the statistics of the synthetic patients to the original data set. And so I'll show on the next slide, which don't go there yet, but on the next slide, I'll, I'll compare the statistics of the synthetic patients to the real patients. The, what you actually care about in this context is there's a specific task that we're trying to perform and the task that we're trying to per perform is a survival analysis. And so the primary way that I evaluated the quality um, was by comparing the survival analysis run using the original data and survival analysis run using the synthetic data and was able to show both graphically and quantitatively that the survival analysis between the real data and the synthetic data matched very well. And so you're ending up, if you use the tool to perform an analysis, you're gonna get effectively the same result as if you had access to the original underlying data. Um, we can go to the next slide. So just uh, the last thing that I'll show is some histograms. This is another way that you can uh, evaluate the statistical performance of your synthetic data is by comparing um, one dimensional histograms. You could obviously com compare uh, joint histograms because it's a multivariate data set, um, but that's a little bit harder to display. So, but just to, to show briefly that the, the one dimensional histograms visually show a good check. You can, again, you can also perform statistical tests quantitative statistical tests that give you a number that says, you know, on a scale of zero to a hundred, how good are we doing? Um, and that basically just quantifies what, what we're seeing visually here. So the in the columns on the left are the original histograms for the original data. The columns on the right are the histograms um, for the synthetic data and for all of the variables that are, are used. Um, not shown on this page, are the categorical um, islet autoantibody combinations. Um, that also was a good match. Uh, and um, uh, if requested, we can provide that um, uh, readout. So I, yeah, I think that this is my last slide. So I'll kick it back to Stephen to talk about some uh, use cases of the CT.
Thanks, Nick. Appreciate that deep dive. Very, very, very helpful stuff, especially for a um, kind of lay person myself when it comes to synthetic data in this type of situation. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll round out this part of our talk looking at a couple of specific use cases. So um, at this point, hopefully we have a decent understand of what the tool is, how this tool works, what the tool shows us, and then how we can put this tool to work by um, kind of iteratively mod modifying different patient populations and understanding what that patient population's risk of progression would look like over time. So um, on the next slide, I'm going to go through four, but really kind of three and a half examples of ways that we can um, look at this tool and see what it really can do. So we're going to start, we're going to just open this tool up. We're going to include every patient um, that's um, in this underlying synthetic data set. And we're going to see what the tool tells us when we look at all patients that are available. Then we're going to look at the TN10 study data based on um, the, the um, New England Journal of Medicine publication from 2019, what is published about the patient characteristics at baseline, and see how that population would be expected to progress based on this tool. We're going to look at that same study, but with some slightly different baseline characteristics for the patients and see how that changes the risk of progression in, in that particular study. And then we're going to, we're going to make this tool really dance for us. We're going to use the same optimized, um, uh, conditions, but we're going to, we're going to play with those different islet autoantibody combinations a little bit and see what that does for us. So starting here on slide 31, and what I'll show you for each of these examples is, um, really the key, the key components from the tool. So what patients, what subject characteristics were included? what the output of that model looks like. We'll do a snapshot of the three-year risk in that population. And then to the right, you'll see some of the summary tables about the patients that were included and about the different um, uh, median or mean risk of progression at each time point. So in this first case, like I said, we're looking at 150 subjects, 50% male, 50% female, and the rest of our characteristics are just wide open. So everyone that this population, everyone that could be included in this population, and we're not going to specify any islet autoantibody combinations. So you can see with this, the three-year risk is about 27%, not particularly high. And if you look in that bottom right chart, you can see that the five-year risk is about 41%. Um, Again, not that impressive in terms of just thinking about anybody that could be included. And I'll note here that anyone that could be included, keeping this tool wide open, um, really we're looking at high risk patients. So this is not just anyone that's been screened. These are patients that already have two islet autoantibodies, patients that are already stage two patients. So patients that are at risk for, um, for progressing to type one diabetes, a near lifetime 100% risk. But as you can see here at three years, you just can't do it. You can't run a trial with your patients if they have a 27% chance of having your um, outcome of interest at three years. Your trial is going to just take way too long to enroll. Okay, so let's let's specify a little bit more. Let's hone in. So again, this is looking on, on the next slide at the TN10 study data that is available. So we're looking at 76 subjects that were included in the study. These patients were a little over 55% male. Um, the, the baseline age Hopefully you guys can see pretty clearly on here, but the baseline age that was included is a range from eight to 50 patients. This is a little bit wider. The, the mean in this subject is a little bit younger, a little bit more narrow, but we're gonna keep this open um, to the whole range of patients that were included. Um, we're looking at a baseline A1C of about five to five and a half. And then we don't have baseline OGTTs available um, in that publication. And so we're just gonna call these patients with some amount of dysglycemia based on um, on OGTT. We're not going to specify for um, islet autoantibody combinations. Some of that data is available in this publication, but um, not quite in the same way that we would want to see it to be able to inform this realistically. So when we run these parameters, what we see is, is nearly 50% at three years. So quite a bit improved from just your, your kind of general back on, background population. Um, at five years, um, we see almost approaching 70% of the risk. So quite a bit higher. You would expect to see quite a few more events during your trial if you included this population. On the next slide, 
looking at just a little bit slightly modified version of this. So the only change that we made in, in playing with these subject characteristics from the previous situation is um, in A1C. We've increased the baseline A1C to five and a half to six now. So again, reflecting some amount of maybe pre-diabetes, but reflecting some amount of dysglycemia in this population. And you can see here clearly the risk of diagnosis at three years jumps pretty significantly. Now up to 70% at three years and nearly 85% by five years. Again, what this allows you to do is really think about a trial design that either includes, um, you know, the same the same number of patients, the same trial design you were originally thinking about, but higher confidence in um, in the results that you would see or expect to see in that population, or possibly to run a study with the same um, the same design but with um, less patients, so that you can have a little bit more of an efficient trial with the same overall design. And when I say design here, I'm not thinking about the design in terms of patient population, but the design in terms of the rest of the study, the duration, the frequency of assessment, et cetera, et cetera, the endpoint that you'd be selecting on and on and on. So maybe the same population, or excuse me, the same study design, um, but a much more refined population, and therefore um, much more power in that study. And then you'll note in these three scenarios, we didn't play with these islet autoantibody combinations. In reality, you know, if you're really selecting for just these um, five different combinations, these five combinations that were determined in the modeling to have some effect on the rate of progression to type 1 diabetes, um, you're really going to be narrowing what patients are eligible in your population in the first place. So unless your therapy is really specifically targeting patients with a particular islet autoantibody type, um, you know, you may not want to hyper-specify various um, islet autoantibody combinations, but you can. This tool allows you the ability to do that based on the results of the modeling um, during the, the qualification opinion analysis. And so on the next slide in our final scenario, we're looking at the exact same scenario that we just looked at in, um, in scenario three, but now we've selected just 100% of our patients to have that IA2 zinc transporter eight combination. Um, I have cherry picked this a little bit because that is the combination that's associated with the highest risk of progression. So I am intentionally kind of um, skewing the results here in the favor of showing what this tool can do. But nonetheless, it shows how powerful this tool can be. With these um, patient characteristics, these subject characteristics, you see a three-year probability of type 1 diagnosis of 81%. Um, at five years, it's nearly 100% risk of progression. Uh, again, you likely wouldn't be designing a trial with just that patient because the time it's going to take you to find those patients will, will probably outweigh any benefits you're going to get from selecting those patients with a higher risk. But you as a, um, as a sponsor of a trial have the ability to really understand what is the right balance between all these components, all these factors for the trial that your company is going to run for the product that you are, are developing. I'm sure there are plenty of questions about this. I see a couple of good questions already popping up in the chat. Um, in just a moment, we will open up this for a, a bit of a panel discussion and Q&A regarding the tool. But one last point that I want to show on this tool, um, as this tool becomes publicly available for use, we are constantly requested by both the funders of the consortium um, and the regulators themselves to have some sort of understanding of how this tool is actually being used and therefore what the impact of this tool is and to help us capture some of that information. When you first access the tool, this is the landing page that you'll be met with. Um, we are asking to collect a couple of pieces of information. Um, this information that is collected here on this page will not be tied to any of the specific analyses that are run. So this is, this is completely decoupled from the specifics of what you are doing with the tool. But what we are asking for is for users of the tool to provide us with an email address, the type of organization that they are coming from, whether that's a, um, an industry sponsor, an academic institution, a, non a nonprofit or research organization, or, or some other type of group. And then the reason that you're using that tool, whether that's to, to plan a particular type of study, whether that's for exploratory purposes or, or something else entirely. These metrics, again, will not be coupled to any sort of specific information in terms of how the tool is being used, but it helps us have a general idea of the, of the impact that this tool has on the community and therefore how we can best either modify this tool as more data is acquired um, or when we design future tools, the clinical trial simulation tool and others in the consortium, make sure that it really does fit with how these tools are generally used um, by the community. Um, so we can discuss this, we can discuss everything else we've talked about. Um, I will pause here. Sarah, I think I'm passing it back to you to um, lead us into our Q&A session.
Yes, and, and we will come back to this slide at the end as well, but um, we'll, we'll display it now while we uh, give all of our speakers a chance to turn their cameras on. Um, thank you, everybody, for walking us through the tool. Um, I will, I'll welcome back JD, Elnaz, and Nick now, um, and we'll we'll close out the slides, but we'll get into our Q&A portion here. Um, so appreciate, appreciate the questions. We were able to answer a couple um, via chat, but we'll probably do some repeats as well just to make sure everybody hears the responses. Um, and yeah, keep those questions coming though, even, even though we're starting into the Q&A. Um, so, so Stephen, I think I'll start with a question for you. I know you just spoke, um, but, but I'll but I'll start with a question for you here because I think I think it is important because it relates to to the FDA. Um, so the question was: Have you had any interaction with CDRH or IVDD regarding IVD development and context of use of the islet autoantibody assays in diagnosing patients for stage one or stage two? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Thanks to, to those that asked the question. It's a great question. Um, the, the short answer is no, we have not at this time. Um, the way that the assays themselves are considered as part of the qualification opinion is um, there's a line in there that basically says um, the assays that were used to provide this information are considered to be adequate for this purpose. And therefore, um, as long as you are using an assay that is um, at least as reliable as those used in the qualification opinion. And those that were used are pretty thoroughly described in, in the information that's available as part of that opinion, um, you're good to go. So we aren't specifically endorsing the assays that were used to provide this data, um, but the conclusion is basically that the assays that were used are sufficient. And as long as you are using an assay that is equally sufficient, um, that's okay. The, the question about thinking about either this tool as sort of a, a software, as a medical device, we're thinking about the assays themselves as an in vitro diagnostic. For now, has been a little bit beyond the scope of the work of the Type 1 Diabetes Consortium. It is something that we have kind of tinkered with or thought about in the past, but, but nothing to date that we've um, really grabbed the hold of and, and run forward. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, now we've gotten uh, a number of other questions kind of focusing in on uh, on the tool itself and kind of some of the capabilities of the tool. Um, so I'll start with this one for, for Nick. Um, can the interface create virtual patients which can be downloaded to a table? Yeah, so the, the current tool doesn't have the capability to create a, a novel synthetic population. We created the synthetic population offline that's used in the tool. Uh, it's a population of size 5,000, which was approximately the same size as the training population that, that went into the tool. Um, but in, in a future rendition, we've certainly discussed this capability of sort of building a synthetic data generator into the tool or a future version of the tool, uh, but it doesn't currently have that capability. I think we can probably provide the synthetic population that N equals 5,000 population. I think we can probably provide that, but uh, someone else would have to, to answer that. Anybody else want to chime in on that before I switch us to the next question? All right. Thank you very much, Nick. Okay, let's see here. Um, and this one, this one I think will be for, for Nick and JD. Um, so just talking about more of what what's in the tool itself, are the default autoantibody combinations representative of actual patient populations? Yeah, so I, um... If you don't make a custom selection, then uh, the default autoantibody uh, combinations will be representative of the synthetic population, which is representative of the true population. Um, so yes, the distribution uh, will just be what you would see in the traditional, in the, in the real population. So just an additional comment on that. Um, so the population synthetic or the actual patient level, they come from the actual study stratum of Teddy. Right, so the distribution is represented in all those population, and you can customize us and make it same to re reflect what you are going to be expecting as part of your uh, trial design. 
Great, great. Um, let's see, I think the next question, um, want to go to more information on the autoantibodies. Um, is there any possibility, um, I guess, and Stephen, Stephen, I might direct this one at you first. Um, is there any possibility of getting information on the occurrence of further autoantibodies in the population? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and I'll, I'll answer this a little bit more broadly than just that, but the way that the modeling works for these tools, the way that these types of model-informed tools work in general, is that as new data is acquired, these models can be updated to reflect that updated um, data set that's been, that's been available now. So as new information is available, um, the, the tool itself can be updated to reflect that tool. So if new data sets are acquired or able to be acquired that has that information, it certainly can be included in future versions of this tool. Um, similarly, when we think about that clinical trial simulation tool that we'll be building in the future that will include a lot of the functionality of this tool itself plus more, that information can certainly be incorporated um, in, into that broader CTS tool. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I think I will switch um, and get switch us over into um, addressing some of the questions on the models that kind of underlie underlie the CT the CTS or CTE tool. Excuse me. Um, so JD, this first one um, I'll, I'll be passing over to you. So uh, we showed those model uh, parameter values, um, and one of our audience members noticed that the estimated shape parameter of the Weibull model seemed to suggest an aging process um, over your chosen time scale. Since risk in T1D is commonly thought to decrease with age, would love to hear your thoughts, comments, and interpretations on this. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, basically the data shows the risk of converting to type 1 diabetes as, and it increases over time um, as the autoimmune process progresses. So the, uh, the idea is that we apply this to the drug development process and the folks that don't end up converting um, will eventually have a lower risk. Now the shape and size um, the, these parameters, they capture the, uh, the baseline. And then you add these COVID aids to either um, increase or reduce the risk to team diagnosis. So and that's how those are captured within the model. Great. Um, and JD, I guess while, while we're on the topic of models, um, one other question that we had uh, is that are, are the models discussed in this webinar um, available? Yes, um, they are available. Um, so if you look at the bottom of the qualification and opinion, you'll see the, the code is available. Um, and then um, Folks can reach out to us if they have any additional questions. We'll be more than happy to provide additional information or clarify any questions that they might have. Great. Thanks, JD. Um, Stephen, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you because we've had um, so, some other questions come in to, uh, come into the chat, uh, kind of about the updates to the tool. So um, so I'll 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 ask you one and then and then maybe another after. Let's let's see how we do on timing here. Um, so are there any plans to add further enrichment parameters into the tool, such as specifying HLA? You know, we, we don't have plans for that just yet. Um, the way that we handled the, the HLA types in this specific model was to define those as either high risk or not high risk patients. And then that was included as a binary covariate. So either you had a high risk type or you did not. And then we assessed to see if that was a significant factor in progression to, to diagnosis, which it was not found to be. So um, for now, we don't have any kind of clear and tangible plans to dive into that component further. Um, part of the reason why we did that was because of the way that HLA data was available to us in the studies that were included. So as we look at the additional data sets that are available, the way that we have that data available, it's certainly possible we, we could look at doing that. But um, to the direct question, no, at this point, we don't have a specific plan to do so. Great. Um, yeah, I'll add a comment oh. there. I think it, it has 
to do a lot with the, the available data, the way you would um, include the HLA in your model. Um, the reason we did it the way Stephen mentioned was depending on the amount of data that was available. Um, so um, we did explore multiple ways of including HLA um, into the model and we included um, high risk um, or not as a binary uh, because of data availability. That doesn't mean that we cannot further export, of course. If you have sufficient data, relevant data to the context of use, of course, I mean, that's, that's, that's a possibility, but uh, yeah. Great. So, so we've talked there about um, the the availability of data um, and and how that that impacts um, the tools that we are able to create the modeling we're able to do. Um, but just to follow up, uh, Stephen, um, as we've been discussing about potentially if there were more data available, what could be updated. Um, so, as a follow up question, will updates to a tool like this be endorsed um, by regulatory authorities such as the EMA? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I don't know. It, it really depends. So um, that type of process of taking a tool that's already been endorsed and then kind of re-updating that is certainly one of the components that's um, included in those available pathways. So at, at, at EMA, the Qualification and Novel Methodologies Pathway, um, I think in the guidance document for that specific pathway, there is some language that says, depending on you know, future data that's available, the future things we learn, this qualification opinion may need to be adapted or modified, potentially even pulled back if um, if new data becomes available. So on um, um, that, that kind of view in mind, um, certainly the intent of these endorsements is not that this is a static thing that never changes, but that as we learn more, as more data becomes available, we're able to include that into those regulatory um, pathways, those regulatory conclusions. Um, as a general comment, going down those endorsement pathways at the agency are pretty resource intensive. And so um, there are ways that we can approach the ability to update these models, make them available to folks with this updated data um, without necessarily having to seek that formal regulatory endorsement, but still doing it in a way that is consistent with what um, has been done. So it's a little bit of a, a vague answer. Um, the, the gist is, yes, it's something we would, we would consider. Yes, it's something we would be very interested in pursuing, um, but it depends on a, a, a lot of different things about what that actually looks like, how significant of the changes are there, um, and, and on and on and on. Yeah, um, I'll make a comment, because um, the qualification, in a sense, is about two or more autoantibodies along with the other things, right? So you can imagine in the future, if we have sufficient data to expand the context of use or adjust or update it, yes, that's a possibility. But the model that the models that provide the evidence for the context of use for the biomarker qualification that stands, of course, within the context of use, uh, there is always, always um, scope that could be increased or expanded if you want to add more variables or expand um, the context of use. So, just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, JD. It's a super important point that the models themselves are not what was endorsed. It's the the use of the autoantibodies and clinical features as enrichment biomarkers, as supported by evidence generated from the models. Thanks for that. Great. Um, I think I'm going to switch now. We've got uh, we've had a couple of different questions come in um, talking about. Uh, Basically, so ex individuals wanting to explore enrichment for their trials, um, but how that might impact impact recruitment. So, so Stephen, I might I might start these this directed at you. Um, so, uh, basically, the uh, the comment being that so we are enriching um, the trial population, but that requires kind of specifying uh, tighter enrollment criteria or more specific enrollment criteria. Um, so, if you could comment on kind of the feasibility or timeline for recruiting um, individuals that are kind of in a more s a selected band. Yeah, sure, sure, happy to. It's a great question. So in, you know, an, an overgeneralized thought process about what are some of those major barriers to having efficient, well-run 
um, clinical trials in this T1D prevention space is the, the ability to find the right patients and then the ability to have enough events occur that your trials don't have to be too long. So the enrollment period and then the actual study period itself. This tool is really looking at shortening or maybe not shortening, but um, adding confidence in the way that you are thinking about the, the study period itself after you have enrolled your patients. And making sure that who you enroll is the right people to have um, an efficient trial. The screening side of things, the finding the right patients to enroll in the first place is another major barrier. And this tool impacts that, but doesn't necessarily directly address it. So there's a balance to find here. Um, as you, you kind of um, alluded to, Sarah, the more specific you are on what patients you want to include, the harder it is to find those patients and the longer it may take you to enroll in your trial. That then gives you the ability to run a shorter, more efficient trial, but there's a trade-off there. So the way that we generally think about these tools is it allows individual trialists, individuals designing trials to, to find the balance that works the best for them. They can say, you know, we're willing to have a little bit of extra time um, required to find patients because we know that that will give us more confidence in the results of our trial. Or you could go the other way and say, no, we want our enrollment period to be short so that we can have our trial moving and running and making progress. And we're willing to accept maybe a little less statistical power um, to, a, to a point in our actual trial itself so that we can enroll more efficiently. Um, that trade-off is a balance that each individual study designer needs to make for themselves based on all the different factors that they need to, to consider. Um, but, but ultimately, it comes down to, to balance and a, and a trade-off of, of one versus the other. Yeah. So um, this my two cents on it. We, you could start with the minimum, right? Enrolling two or more, right? And then you could go from there, right? So um, you could, if if um, it's difficult to enroll or it takes longer, you could always, so like Steen was saying, it's a trade-off. So think of starting from, okay, enrolling folks with two or more autoantibodies. And then if you want to, and with some more, then you can adjust the HPMC, adjust the OGTC and so forth, right? So, but you will have to trade off trying to find those specific individuals that satisfy this, but you would gain in terms of a shorter duration, right? So that's something that you have the ability to do depending on your situation. Yeah, and I'll add to this, you know, we, we get a lot of questions about this tool, about the way that these types of enrichment strategies affect the ultimate labeling um, for, for a product. And, and, and it's ultimately the same answer. There's a balance and there's a trade-off. Um, the, the enrichment um, guidance document that I referenced from FDA addresses this point as well, that, you know, generally speaking, the, the, the population that you study is going to be reflected in the label of your product. Um, there are certain exceptions to when that can be a little bit expanded or not, depending on how you are enriching your study. Um, but again, it's a trade-off. You know, it's, a, it's an individual sponsor's decision to make about who they want to enroll, how efficient or short they want their trial to potentially be, and how big the, the patient population who, who may be eligible to on-label use that product um, may then be. There, there's a balance in all these factors that each individual designer is going to have to, to find. Yeah, one final comment I make uh, is the, the the idea is to run trials of reasonable duration, right? So two to three years, how do we do that? And that's what our pursuit was in order to answer that question, what what do we do? So the answer to that was two or more of antibodies. And then if depending how, what more can we do in terms of enrichment? And then you start tweaking the HPMC and so forth, right? So. That's, I just want to make sure there is a through line between where we're coming from and what we are trying to do here and how best we can we can serve, right? So. Great. Thank you both for your comments on that. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I want to make sure that we get people out on time. So I'm just noting we probably have about 10 minutes left that we'll be able to use for Q&A, uh, maybe, maybe a couple less. Um, but I do want to come back to some questions on synthetic data. Um, and Elnaz, I might I might start with you and then and then Nick, I'll have a couple follow-up questions for you after that. So um Elnaz, just for starters. 
um, can the synthetic data set uh, behind the CTE tool be shared? Yes, that is an excellent question. So that's actually something that we are going to have to look into given the structure of the data sharing agreements that we have with our numerous data providers. Um, so that's something I don't have an answer for right now, but um, we will look into it and we can certainly provide updates via the tool um, as, as we go along and we have users use it. So thank you for the question. Great. Um, so, so related, uh, but this one I'll, I'll direct towards you, Nick. Um, so uh, to clarify, the, the tool uses synthetic patients. Um, how can I be confident that the recommendations are accurate or useful? Yeah, so again, the, the process of synthetic data generation is, is entirely based on statistical fidelity, the way that the training algorithm is designed is to maximize statistical fidelity between the synthetic patients and the, and the true underlying population. Of course, it depends on your specific task, so that's why we sort of analyze the performance in terms of the task that we're interested in here, which is the uh, survival analysis. So, and obviously, um, more details are available uh, if anyone needs. Uh, we're working on a, a technical uh, paper that will uh, describe some of these details in in, uh, in more detail. Oh yeah, thanks thanks for mentioning yeah. that, Nick. Go ahead, JD. Yeah, so like Nick was saying, um, the question, of course, is like, um, how can we be sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing because we are not using the actual patient, right? So like Nick was saying, we need to make sure that the downstream process, not just the the statistical, um, it, it's statistically sound, but also when you go about doing the survival analysis, does it make, does the results make sense, right? So we had to put in a lot of effort to make sure that the synthetic population is sort of representative of the actual population population. And by that, I mean, it's able to give you the same results when you do, when you apply to the model, um, and get the survival plots for each individual, right? So that sort of is a, 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 a test to ensure that, a sanity check to ensure that this population, if let's, this is essentially if you go about recruiting, this is what you would come across for your patient population. Although this is synthetic, but you can imagine going and recruiting, what sort of population would you come across? This is what you would come across, right? So this, this will give you an idea there, a little bit more context. Great, thank you. Okay, um, switching gears a little bit. Um, Stephen, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you uh, for comments on this question first, but other folks can chime in after that. Um, have you run the tool to look at overall balance of placebo and treatment groups uh, that is in trial net 10, and what type of balancing with regulators request or not when the tool is being used? Yeah, you know, we, we have it. When we think about considering what that looks like in a trial, that, that's really what the clinical trial simulation tool that we will be building will help us um, look at. That model will include both placebo effect, also trial dropout rates, um, the, the ultimate interface that we will see for that clinical trial simulation tool will look very similar to the, the screenshots and the, the kind of live demo um, that was shared today. But instead of just seeing one line showing disease progression, what you'll actually be able to see is, is two lines, your control arm and your treatment arm. And you'll be able to see how the different patient characteristics, the different trial design parameters are expected to impact um, your, your treatment arm versus your placebo arm in that trial. Part of that tool will include what percentage, what proportion of patients you want to have in your control arm versus your treatment arm to help show you how that will affect those things. Um, so, um, you know, the short version to your question is that this tool itself doesn't really help us answer that question um, in, in its current form, but the future tool that we'll be working towards, that bigger, broader CTS tool, clinical trial simulation tool, will be able to help answer that exact question. Great, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, let's see here, I'm keeping an eye on 
the clock. Um, th this one might be similar, Stephen, um, but any way to get information on predicted progression to stage two or other expected numerical progression towards dysglycemia? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, and it's something we have talked quite a bit about how we can really leverage the data set we've built to answer that question. So thinking about progression from earlier stages of disease, so maybe from stage one to stage two before, or in addition to thinking about progression from stage two to stage three. Um, it is certainly something we've got kind of keen eyes on, something that we really expect to be a part of the consideration in the type 1 diabetes consortium, thinking about now not just three data sets for the CTE tool, but these 10 data sets that are available to us, how we can really put those um, put those data sets to work to answer th this type of question. Um, I think that, you know, being able to look at a stage one patients with an endpoint of progression to stage two would be a pretty remarkable step to take for the field when we think about both, you know, the number of patients that we're able to find to enroll in our studies, um, the, the potential for um, shorter trials in that population. I think there's a lot of potential to kind of overcome some of the barriers that we face in this space by doing so. Um, so yeah, it, it is something we've got pretty keen eyes on being able to leverage this larger data set for, um, but again, this current tool, um, it's not quite what this tool is able to, um, to do for us today. All right, thanks, Stephen. Um, let's see, I think I'm about ready to wrap up the Q&A and bring Elnaz back on for closing remarks. Um, but but Elnaz, I will, I will have the last question to you here, um, which is the last question that came through in the chat, uh, which is what is the status of the CTS tool? Since we've been discussing that a lot in this Q&A portion. Yeah, so actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to loop in um, Stephen to speak to this. As I mentioned, I'm very new to CPAT. This is my sixth week. So I'm going to punt it to Stephen because he can answer it better than I can. Sure, and, and I might punt some of this over to, to JD, who's been now starting <laughs> to help me in the weeds helping. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, we are, where we are at now with this tool, we've been very fortunate to collaborate pretty closely with um, Juan Francisco Morales and Sarah Kim from the University of Florida, who have been also working to develop a, a T1D prevention CTS tool. Um, with, um, with that collaboration, we've been able to already make some big progress on that, despite really just being at the beginning of the T1D consortium's work plan. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll poke over to JD to comment any more on that now, but I'll, I'll say that we are anticipating our first submission to the regulators to really start the regulatory endorsement pathway for the CTS tool by the end of this year. So we're hoping for really the beginning of Q4, um, middle of Q4 to have that first regulatory submission to uh, FDA, in this case first, for the CTS tool by the end of this year. Um, JD, if there's any other comments you want to make about just um, kind of where we're at with what we're doing with the modeling, feel, feel free to jump in. Yeah, so in terms of timeline, uh, Steve, when you go with that, in terms of the modeling, of course, it's all heavily data dependent and it's a regulatory submission. So you can imagine um, those take their own uh, due diligence in time. Um, in terms of like the modeling itself, um, there's um, a number of different components that we want to add to expand the scope from the CT to CTF tool, right? So, and that all would depend on the data. Um, so the efforts of data curation, getting to analysis set that is appropriate for this, for the context of use with CTF, that's all ongoing. So we'll provide more details um, as to what exactly is uh, different uh, milestones that we are trying to shoot for, um, but uh, yeah. Um. And, and, and I said it before, I'll say it again, we, you know, the more that we can bring in the whole community into that effort, the better the, the ultimate tool will be for the community. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about the CTS tool, about the future work, about taking part in that work or sharing data with the effort, um, again, we'll have a slide that pops up with some information and more, more information will be emailed to you. Please do reach out um, through any channels possible. We would love to have the conversation about how we can work together to do so. Great. 
thanks, Stephen. With that, with that call, let's go ahead and have um, all of our our panelists. Thank you so much for participating in the Q and A. But you can now come off video, and we'll we'll end today's presentation um, with with Elnaz providing some closing remarks for us. So thanks again to our panelists for answering all those questions. And Elnaz, I will uh, disappear now as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So first, a huge thanks to everyone who attended today's. Uh, webinar and for contributing your questions and really participating in the discussion. Uh, this tool is something that we as a consortium are very excited to share with the T1D community and we look forward to having you use it and to provide your uh, feedback and input as, as we think about um, future work that we do as a consortium as well. So as Sarah mentioned, and as the team mentioned, there's some very helpful links on these slides uh, to work that we've already done, as well as to the tool itself. And if you have any questions or additional feedback for us, or you'd like to participate in the design of the CTS tool, uh, the email address where we can be reached is on this uh, slide as well. Uh, just to also mention again, as Sarah indicated at the beginning of the call, that this will be sent, uh, the slides as well as the recording will be sent out uh, following today's webinar. Um, and you're uh, welcome to use uh, use the tool and to share this with, uh, with anyone else that you think would be interested in it. So thank you all again. Thank you to the panelists for the uh, excellent presentation. And we look forward to speaking to everyone again soon. <laughs>